Hello. My story starts in the 1970s. I was a new graduate of electrical engineering. I was confused. I was angry. And I didn't understand. And the thing that I didn't understand above all was why humans seemed to be determined to trash the planet that was their only home. And as I started reading round to try to understand, I found a book which helped. Small is Beautiful by Fritz Schumacher, an eminent economist in the UK at that time. And he explained the importance of organization, the importance of organizing economic activity, and the importance of being active to change things. Lots of things began to fall into place. I joined environmental organizations. I got involved in green politics. And I started thinking about the economy. I turned out to be rather a bad politician, so I left that behind, but I became fascinated and convinced that the economy was a large part of the problem. So I thought I'd better go back to university and study economics, which I did. I got an MSc, as many of you have, and I got a PhD, and the subject of my PhD was the subject of my talk tonight. What is the relationship between economic growth and the environment and natural resources? And as I got into this topic, I found that, as with many topics, there was a large literature which had been largely kicked off by this book, published by the Club of Rome, called Limits to Growth. And the thesis of this book was pretty simple. It said that a combination of human population growth and exponential growth in the economic activities of that population, combined with the resource depletion and the pollution that that set in train, would lead on current trends within 100 years to something that they called overshoot and collapse, by which they broadly meant the end of human civilization and everything that we hold dear. And initially, I was kind of inclined to go along with that thesis. I became aware of these sorts of trends, whereby you can see the extent to which material consumption has grown since, 20, since 1850. Starting where we were broadly a biomass-based economy, and then especially in the 1950s, increasing our use of construction minerals, industrial minerals and metals, and above all, fossil fuels. And I began to think, how does that relate to economic activity? And the relationship seemed pretty clear. Not just between economic activity and material use, but between economic activity and energy use. As I say, mainly fossil fuels, which when combusted, give us carbon dioxide, which is the main greenhouse gas responsible for climate change. And it still seems to me that in terms of physical growth, if our economies go on growing on that sort of pattern, then the prognosis of limits to growth is likely to prove correct. And we're still less than halfway through the century that they gave us. And subsequent updates from that book have suggested that we're pretty well on track for overshoot 
and collapse. So why, when I worked through my PhD, did I come to a very different conclusion? That our economies can go on growing without overshoot and collapse. And that's what I want to explain tonight. One piece of evidence comes from this slide, which shows on the left the relationship between material consumption and economic growth of the OECD countries, countries belonging to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, broadly the old industrial countries. And you can see that it's a very different relationship from that on the right, which is the relationship between GDP and material consumption and the world as a whole, which continues to increase. And I became fascinated with the possibility that public policy could change these relationships. And I started to look in much more detail at the experience of the UK. Not because the UK is particularly special, but because it shows some trends which are also shown in other countries and because I happened to be here. So the UK, since 1970, has experienced economic growth, as you can see. And it's fascinating because for some environmental in, uh, issues, along with that growth, has gone environmental improvement. So if we look at sulfur dioxide emissions, which were one of the main causes of acid rain, which was a very great concern in the 1980s, you can see that since 1970, despite the growth of the economy, they have gone down by some 90%. And the same is true for some other air emissions. Not all, and there are still some which give great cause for concern, not least nitrogen dioxide. But if we look now at water pollution, and biochemical oxygen demand is an indicator of water pollution, you can see that again, despite economic growth, the water in the UK since 1970 has become much cleaner. This doesn't happen in all countries, and obviously if you went back a century or more, you would find a very different relationship between UK economic growth and the cleanliness of its rivers. Now let's look at energy consumption because that of course is where we get CO2 emissions which are what we're concerned about principally in climate change. And you can see that again in the UK energy demand has not been growing despite the growth of the economy. And along with that as you would expect not only have CO2 emissions not been growing, they have actually been declining because we have been getting our energy increasingly from cleaner and cleaner sources. Now, there are many reasons why these trends happen. One of the fascinating things of being a policy academic is to tell the story behind those trends. And they are complex stories. But where we've had growth and the environment has got better, it is normally the result of public policy. And I want to illustrate that with something really dramatic from the UK, which is what has happened with our waste and recycling. My time series here starts in 1996, at which time well over 90% of the UK's waste was put into holes in the ground, which we call landfill. Recycling was just two or three percent. And in 1996, we introduced a landfill tax at a relatively low level to start with. But as you'll see from the slide, it grew very rapidly. And along with its growth, the quantity of landfill fell equally dramatically, such that we now landfill less than 50% of our waste, and we recycle more than 40% of it. Again, it's a complicated story. There are a number of policy instruments behind that, but certainly the landfill tax 
had an enormous influence on that outcome. So let's think now, the global level. Here we have gross world product, global GDP, and global greenhouse gas emissions on the increase. That's what is going to cause an uninhabitable planet for many people if that trend is allowed to continue. And of course, climate change is not the only issue we need to be concerned about. We also need to worry about biodiversity, the fate of the some 30 million species with whom we share this planet, but which are now disappearing at a rate which is comparable to the great species extinctions in the past. And the Living Planet Index from the Worldwide Fund for Nature shows that rate of loss of species doesn't seem terribly dramatic there, but is much, much higher than the background rate. So we have these challenges, and there are some who say that in order to address them, we will have to stop our economies growing. Quite apart from the fact that I'm not sure how we know, whether we know how to do that intelligently, I want to just explore whether it would be necessary to do that. And I want, therefore, to look a bit into the future. And this comes from a study recently published in Nature, which looked in great detail at Australia, so not the UK this time, and globally. So these are the projections for Australian economic growth going through to 2050. You can see that these researchers think that Australia is going to become a much richer place. These are the projections for greenhouse gas emissions on current policies. And you can see they follow the same kind of trajectory as the global emissions that we've just seen. What the researchers then did was put into their models all the policies they could think of using current technologies only that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And this was the trajectory that came out. Not only do greenhouse gas emissions fall fairly dramatically, but they go negative through the implementation of what are called negative emission technologies. Let's look now at their projections for global GDP and greenhouse gas emissions going forward. Again, the world projected to be a much richer place, which will be good news for the many countries that still do not have basic economic goods and services. And global greenhouse gas emissions on current policies, which lead us to average global warming of between four and five degrees, a planet that humans have absolutely no experience of and which many of us would not survive. And then they implement the policies, the technologies that are available to us, and we get this kind of trajectory. You will all be aware, I know, that the heads of state and governments in the world have recently met in Paris, and they have come to an agreement, the intention of which is to go for that lower line. What I know, as an academic, is that that reflects the realistic prospect of the implementation of the technologies that are already available to us. Technologies of renewable energy, technologies of energy storage, technologies of smart grids, technologies of energy efficiency and resource efficiency. What I also know is that if we were to implement these technologies, there is absolutely no evidence at all that that would stop economic growth. Quite the reverse. It could easily unleash a new generation of economic growth, which comes precisely from the sorts of innovation and technological change which that sort of dynamic could bring about. But what I also know from my example with the landfill tax is that this desirable development will not 
come about by itself. Heads of state signing documents in Paris does not reduce global emissions by one ton. What reduces emissions is when they go home and put in place the kinds of policies that implement the kinds of technologies and changes in behavior which we know are possible and which many countries have already begun to implement. So coming back to my question, can our economies go on growing forever? Well, my crystal ball doesn't show me forever. But I know they can for the next few decades, which is all I'm really interested in. <laughs> And I also know that they can do that without costing the earth. If we act with the capacity for intelligence, wisdom, and technological innovation of which we are capable. And that's the challenge that we face. Thank you very much. <laughs>